Hi everyone, my name is Christine Bird and I'm a political scientist and I study the Constitution and the Supreme Court and how public policy makes its way through the litigation system. So I'm coming to you today from my living room because we are now in online instruction. And online instruction is a response to the COVID-19 crisis that the international community is facing right now. So we are all social distancing, we are on lockdown, I am in my house and making this recording for you. So in times like this, in emergency periods in American history, who do we look to for support and directive and information on how we should move forward? And that person typically for most individuals in the United States is of course, the president. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what powers does the president have in an emergency situation like this one. So I'm going to start by talking about the president's powers generally in an emergency period. And I'm going to do my best to have a couple of slides integrated through this presentation. And then we're going to talk about the historical context of presidential emergency powers, the conflict that comes between the president and Congress in times of emergency. And then I'm gonna walk through a little bit about um, what public health emergencies typically look like and what laws are in place to empower the president to do something about a public health crisis like the one we're in right now. So first I want to start with the constitutional text. So let's take a quick look at Article 2. Now that you've looked up Article 2 in your textbook, I want you to look through there and see if there's anything about an emergency power. So if you've read Article 2, which most of you have by now, you'll notice that there is no express emergency power in the United States. There is nothing that says, yes, the president can do all these sorts of things in times of an emergency. He can do A, B, C, D. So you'll find that when you look at Article 2, there are no expressly given powers to the president that deal with emergency situations. However, there are powers expressly granted to the legislative branch, to Congress. So those powers are suspending habeas corpus and providing for the militia to execute the laws of the union and suppress insurrections and repel invasions. But again, no express powers are given to the president of the United States. So we understand that these powers are implied and an implied power means that while not expressly granted in the text, we typically understand that these powers are necessary for the president and we act as if they are um, included in the constitutional layout. So first, why would we want the president to have emergency powers? Well, first, it's a lot easier for one person to act, i.e. the president, than 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 members of the Senate to act in unison. So if we need quick action to address an emergency situation. So first, he's a unitary actor. Second, they can act quickly. And third, presumably the president is elected by the population. So the, the voting population of the United States elects the president and therefore represents the most amount of people in the country at any given point in time. So we understand that the power of the president is implied, but how do we know if this implied power is constitutional at any given point in history? So where do we go? Like most questions, we have to turn to the Supreme Court and the power of judicial review. To review, judicial review is the power of the Supreme Court to validate the constitutionality of any government action. Judicial review is very powerful. We get that from the first case, Marbury versus Madison. Where do we look to see how the Supreme Court is going to use its power of judicial review? Well, the first place we will look is the one of the most important separation of powers Supreme Court cases, which of course is Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company v. Sawyer. This is often referred to as the Steel Seizure case or Youngstown. Youngstown is a case where the Supreme Court invalidated 
Harry Truman's seizure of a set of steel mills during the Korean War. During the Korean War, we were strapped for equipment and Harry Truman decided that he was going to take over a set of steel mills to create wartime um, products. So he was going to take over this set of steel mills to create and um, induce the supply chain for, for war-related products. We get several opinions out of this case, the most important of which is actually a concurrence, not the majority opinion. So this is a very important thing to remember. So the controlling case law in this area is actually not something we talk about anymore. So the majority opinion is written by Justice Black. And Justice Black, Hugo Black, for those of you that are familiar. So Justice Hugo Black actually wrote the majority opinion. The majority opinion is, of course, the controlling doctrine here. We'll get to that point in a minute. Hugo Black's majority opinion stated that this she, this seizure of the steel mills was an invalid use of constitutional authority by Harry Truman. So they are not supposed to seize the steel mill. The most important concurring opinion, and actually the one we treat as controlling law today, even though it was not the majority opinion, which put an asterisk on that is very rare, was Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson's concurrence. Robert Jackson gave us the tripartite test for assessing whether a presidential action in a time of emergency is constitutional. So the tripartite test, there are three levels of presidential power, and I'll put these in um, a slide here while I'm talking about them. So at the strong, at the highest level of presidential power, we call the strongest level of presidential power is when the president is acting with express or strongly implied authority from Congress. So that means that Congress has said, yes, president, you can do this particular thing. At the lowest level, at the third level, the weakest level, we have the president acting in direct defiance of a congressional order. So Congress has said, you cannot do this thing and the president does it anyway. And that is not constitutional. But so we also have a name for everything that is in between these two levels. So in the middle is what we call the zone of twilight. And the zone of twilight is where Congress has made no direct order about what the president can or cannot do in this time. But the president acts anyway. And we'll give a few examples of that coming up. So most of the discussion about presidential emergency powers come up when we're talking about wartime and wartime power, wartime authority, because again, the president is the commander in chief. If the president sends troops to Libya or troops to Iraq or troops to Afghanistan, they are acting in their capacity as commander in chief. If we go back to 1973, Congress passed what is called the War Powers Act. So the War Powers Act of 1973 is a congressional act that reigns in presidential wartime powers in response to the ongoing Vietnam War. This act was passed by a congressional override um, of an executive veto from Richard Nixon. The War Powers Act requires a couple of things of the president if they are going to engage in any military action. The first of which is that the president must notify Congress within 48 hours, whenever military forces are introduced into hostilities or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by the circumstances. So this translates to any time that the president deploys troops, that there are boots on the ground, or that there's any type of military campaign in a foreign country, that the president must notify Congress of this campaign within 48 hours. The second thing that the War Powers Act requires is that the president is required to end all foreign military actions after 60 days of the original start time unless Congress authorizes a declaration of war or an authorization of the operation to continue. So what this means is that all the troops have to come home within 60 days if Congress does not declare war. So you may be thinking to yourself, does this ever happen? Because we certainly are involved in a lot of overseas conflicts that are not declared war by Congress. And your answer to that is yes, yes, we do. What has happened is that the War Powers Resolution 
is completely ignored by the president. The president office, no matter who's holding the office, it could be a Republican or a Democrat, this is regardless of party, they see it as an encroachment on their constitutionally implied powers to protect the country as commander in chief. So the president's office typically ignores the War Powers Resolution and says that it's unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court has never decided on this case. It was asked to once in 2000 when there was a um, military deployment to Yugoslavia and they declined to engage in writing an opinion on this case because they didn't want to get between Congress and the, and the president. And this is a very important thing to remember because the War Powers Act is it's not in itself unconstitutional, but is instead regarded as unconstitutional by the president um, as an institution, not the president as a person. And Congress, no matter who's sitting in Congress, sees that the War Powers Act is constitutional and still tries to use this as uh, one of their one of their powers. So examples of controversies where the War Powers Act was invoked and thus ignored by the President of the United States at the time was when Ronald Reagan deployed military personnel to El Salvador. Another instance was in 1999, Bill Clinton deployed troops to Kosovo and did not bring them back within 60 days. So um, defied the declaration of war requirement. And another time is when Barack Obama I think this was in 2011, deployed a military airstrike in Libya. Of these three acts, none is technically unconstitutional because it has not been declared such by the Supreme Court under their power of judicial review. So up to this point in the lecture, we've been talking about the constitutionality of emergency powers by the president. And now I'm going to talk about things that are actually in the zone one that are on level one of the Youngstown sheet and tube test, which is where the president is operating with the express authority of Congress. These are statutory authorizations, meaning they were passed by both houses of Congress and are now the law of the land. They are not constitutionalized because they are not part of the constitutional law, but they are statutes, meaning they have the force of law. So the first is the National Emergencies Act. And this is a very vague statute. Um, emergency is not well defined here. We saw this as a recent controversy when Donald Trump declared that there was a national emergency in terms of immigration and tried to use this act to um, get funding to build a border wall at the southern border of the United States. We also have the Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, and I'm going to read a little bit of that to you now, and I'll make sure to put it on the screen. Today, I'm going to focus on the ones that affect public health because that's the type of emergency that we are in right now. Of course, there are many that involve the military. There are many that involve um, issues that came up after 9-11. That was a huge area of uh, statutory lawmaking to respond to the terrorist attacks on 9-11. But today, I'm focusing specifically on the ones that relate to public health. So of these public health statutes, there, of course, is the National Emergencies Act. And this act is very vague. Emergency is not well defined here. We saw it recently be used by Donald Trump to um, try to secure funding for a border wall with um, the, so the southern border of the United States. And that had a lot of political backlash that came with it. Um, we also have the Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistant Act, Assistance Act. And I'll read a section of that to you now. Section 247D, if the secretary determines after consultation with such public health officials as may be necessary, that one, a disease or disorder presents a public health emergency, or two, a public health emergency, including significant outbreaks of infectious diseases or bioterrorist attacks otherwise exist, the secretary may take such action as may be appropriate to respond. So this clearly could apply to our situation today um, in terms of responding to COVID-19. Another example of a public health statute authorizing the president and the executive branch to make decisions regarding the public health response comes from 42 USC section 1320B5. The Secretary of Health and Human Services may waive confidentiality certification, sanctions, and other provisions as necessary to support public health services. And this act actually came in 2000, 
to as as one of the the 9-11 response acts. Um, 21 USC section 360 B BB3 states that the Secretary of Health and Human Services may authorize the use of an unapproved drug device or biological product or approve use of an approved drug device or biological project product from 2004. So this is a statute we might see um, used to bypass normal FDA regulations for um, animal testing or the testing protocols in order to develop a, a vaccine to combat COVID-19. A few more. Um, this is actually also part of 21 USC uh, Section 360 is that a determination by the Secretary of Homeland Security that there is a domestic emergency or a significant potential for a domestic emergency like COVID-19 involving a heightened risk of attack with a biological, chemical, radiological, or nuclear agent or agents. So you can see here that we're responding mostly to things like terrorist attacks is I think what they had in mind here. Of course, this is, you know, like we just said, a response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks and preparing the country to respond to another uh, attack on our homeland. Um, this one, the next section says the determination by the Secretary of Defense that there is a military emergency or a significant potential for a military emergency involving a risk to the United States military. Um, the third one here is very important for our the issue we're facing today, a determination by the secretary that there is a public health emergency or a significant potential threat for a public health emergency, again, like COVID-19, that affects or has a significant potential to affect national security or the health and security of United States citizens living abroad. And all of these sections I would like to note here have been used to respond to all sorts of public health events. Everything from anthrax to the Ebola outbreak, um, also used during the Zika virus scare recently. So all of these portions of the statute have been used to respond to public um, health outbreaks like COVID-19. Um, of course, none of these were as pervasive or as such an international concern as COVID-19, but we can see how the government might be using these statutes in the future. The, the last one I want to bring up today is that the president may use the public health service to such extent and in such a manner as shall their judgment promote to the public interest, or the president may, by executive order, declare the commission corps of the public health service to be a military service. And this comes from 1944. So it's clear that there are a lot of powers in the president's hand to respond to an outbreak like COVID-19. And this involves issuing an executive order that everyone in the country has to shelter in place. We haven't seen this to date. I'm recording this on March 24th of 2020, but the president can certainly do that should he decide to. Um, he can militarize the public health service. And that, um, of course, opens up all of his commander in chief powers that we talked about at the beginning. So the response to COVID-19 by the president is an unprecedented area of constitutional law and of um, presidential studies in general. So we're not really sure what's about to happen. Even those of us that study this for a living and have made this our professional, um, our professional life is studying what president and the Supreme Court and what Congress do in times of crisis. But what I can say is that they have unlimited power to do almost anything that they need to do or that they see that they need to do in order to combat the spread of a disease like COVID-19. So what I want students to take away from this lecture is that there is a tripartite test for testing whether there's a constitutional use of presidential power. We don't know much about how that test applies in a fact specific way because it hasn't been challenged very often. And we know that the president has a lot of power here. If we go back to the Federalist Papers, we know that James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and the framers of the Constitution were very concerned with the president having too much power. So I want all students to think and reflect on the use of power here and think about every government action as, is this a constitutional use of presidential power? Is this a wise use of presidential power? And the constitutionality of something and whether something is wise 
are not necessarily the same analysis. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this lecture today. And what I want you to take away is that there is a framework for evaluating a presidential action during an emergency. We just have to decide how we're going to implement that because as of right now, only the Supreme Court decides through their power of judicial review whether or not the constitutional action by the president was in fact constitutional. So thanks for hanging out with me today and uh, good luck. Feel free to email me with any questions about today's lecture. My email address is below and I'm happy that I had the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you.